E mua moa ono o whātālo whā atu i o paia mama malu mawalunga. I paia mama malu o tangata e ana nei whanoa o lo o ngale unue eile nei pokalame o Treasure Islands. Tangata na mua i malae. Le tangata paramada le nei maile i tū mālo o tangata Darik. O lātou tua ā, ma lātou ā inga, o lo o no nofo ma tau sia nei nei whanoa mai le amatanga e o o le whaawawau. O le nei pokalame na fausia ma nisi o tangata mai le atanu pasifika o lo o no nofo i Sydney o Sitalia. O le nei ngaluenga, o tala lava o tangata mai lona lava i loa i mea sina, ma tala o mea sina o lo o te oina i le Powerhouse Museum. A whai o i eise upu po se tala wopa o i papa, Fa ma ngalo le nei au auna vai vai. Ta tau te fa ma lulu atu o le a ma tau fa so i le ngana fa per tania. A usi mai lau sila sila o le a ma tau tau ma fai atu. A lo fa atu le lau le o tanoi. Tala fa lava. Welcome to another episode of Treasure Islands where we're going to bring to you some more community engagement with our Pacific collection here at the Museum of Applied Arts and Science, the Discovery Center in Castle Hill. But before we get there, check this out behind me. Mate, if you don't know, I think it's a, a Auto Giro, the prototype of the helicopter. We're going to take you today, ladies and gentlemen, to Papua New Guinea. We're going to visit a family here in Sydney and they're going to talk to us about the amazing objects in the collection and some of the amazing objects and treasures that they have brought from their own collection. So let's go to Papua New Guinea. I'll see you there because I'm going by the auto tour. See you soon. Good day, everyone. I'm doing very well, and it's an absolute honor to be to be here with you and to go through this process. And uh, I think my kids are just as honored, and Manuel and myself, we, we're just honored to make the trip from Wollongong. Yes. Uh, but absolute honor to be here. I am the president of the Fort Association. We just uh, established some three years ago. It's called the Papua New Guinea Cultural Association, New South Wales. And uh, our main goal is to maintain anything that is cultural, whether it should be song, dance, face painting, yes, uh, that, that sort of thing. So that's that's my role. I've been passionate about it, but do my very little that I can with that limited resource and be able to do this. And it's that, yes. that's why I'm very happy to promote that cultural yeah. uh, aspect of our identity. And John, how many uh, PNG people do you think is in Sydney, Australia? People can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it would be in the estimate of between four and five hundred. Okay. Uh, that population is uh, increased or decreased depending on how many Papua New Guinean uh, people are getting OSAID studies or scholarship or private sponsor to study in the Australian educational institutions in New South Wales. Okay, awesome. Before we get deeply into our discussion here at Treasure Islands, um, could you introduce us to uh, the kids and to everyone? Yeah, I start with uh, who's here on my left straight away. It's Martina. Martina was supposed to be Martin because the doctors got it all wrong. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I wanted to name him Martin after my dad. Yes. And the moment I took it, I said, oh, something is wrong, something is missing. And then they said, no, it's a girl. <laughs> okay, let's just put a little A at the back and Martin becomes Martina. Martina. So and then, that's Martina. Milena. Milena is um, Milena. after our GP. She's been very, very good to us. So we said, if it's a girl, we call a name after you. And yes, she was. Okay. But, whether she was lucky or the doctor was lucky. But that's Milena. Milena. And... It's got a very Irish name because I grew up with the Irish people, okay. uh, the Irish missionaries in Papua New Guinea. Yes. The person who really uh, encouraged me in education and life and direction was an Irishman by the name of John Ryan. Okay. So he's automatically John Ryan. 
Yes. So we put a um, iPhone the word, so I am John, so we to differentiate is John, Ryan, and I'm John. Excellent. And then here's Emmanuel. We speak the same language, we call the Melpa language in the um, uh, Western Islands province in Mount Hagen. Okay. So we speak exactly the same language, uh, we have family connections. Uh, what do we have here? It looks like a drum. Or what is this in your language? Yes, it's, it's a drum. Uh, the most popular name in every, almost every part of Papua New Guinea, from the highlands to the coast, is called a kundu or, or a kundu drum. Kundu drum. So it's usually um, mainly the main purpose is to go with the dancing steps. Yes. You know, and it's single bit, double bit, triple bit. Uh, but uh, sometimes they use it for different purposes to make an announcement. But it's rarely done that. But the bigger ones, they carve it out, use sticks. And uh, that's more of a garamut, but this is a kundu drum, and it's more used in um, uh, dances. It, it looks fragile to me. It looks pretty uh, organic, and it's been done through just hands instead of using any mo uh, modern uh, yeah. tools, yes. uh, which makes it special. I think it's it, you, you could feel the you know the. You can feel the energy of the person or the vision or this almost the spiritual connection to this thing. Yeah. Uh, that's that's special than something what I have here is more touristic. So if you if I take this too, you can you can see it's more vanished or polished. Yes. Um, I mean anybody can stay at the international airport and sell this for five dollars or something, but that's different. But, yeah. You know because this has got. Uh, more of the culture and person and the spiritual world, it's so much in here. And so the top, the, the skin, what's yeah. the skin made from? Uh, the skin you know, the from the uh, highlands, we are the possums. You know, the poor possums. They, yes. they get, we consume the meat, but the skin is taken out, dried out in a special way, and they put it here. But what we have here, and what I also see here, is more what something and we call it alai. Okay. Alai. It's more from the lizard, bigger lizards, reptiles. Uh, reptiles uh, I think it's more uh, something close to a guana. Yes. But guana might be too bigger. But that's that. They also get the meat. Yes. But the most valuable part is the skin because that's. And you've got to know how to dry it. Yes. It does not go too dry. It doesn't go too moist. Just enough to get it in place. Okay, and on the front of it, you've got like dangling down, it's like some beads. Yes, shake it. Yes, I mean, that's, that's part of the dancing, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's also the musical, that's in addition to it. You know, you hit the drum, you know, hit the drum, and uh, sometimes you're dancing. And once you go the double bit, you know, so you get that extra sound added on to it, or that means, okay, I think that chorus is now come to an end. Let's start another chorus of this, this little thing to remind the dancers. Yes. Or, or to make it a, a good introduction or conclusion of the dance itself. So. And what kind of uh, dances or ceremonies do you mainly, is there different types of yeah. ceremonies where you do the dances? Uh, absolutely, I think it's, uh, the dancers have very different uh, values, different times. Sometimes you prepare for years because there's a feast that uh, coincides with, with the dancing. Okay. Uh, if somebody, if my tribe has been uh, supported by a neighboring tribe in going to warfare, and then they lost some people. So now I've got to uh, express my gratitude through a big feast, and that feast has to be connected with the, with the dance. So the dancing is, so while the dancing is happening, sometimes the preparation bit, takes much more longer. You've got specialists to paint the face, you've got specialists to arrange your feathers, you've got specialists to uh, put all kinds of things in. Amazing. And so the kids are obviously painted up, their faces are painted up. Did you do that, John? Uh, I, I try my best. That's, uh, Martina has been dancing in New South Wales, in Canberra and in Sydney. That's from a mother's side. See, okay. it's a uh, very, the Mekio, Haruku, they are very, very popular. They are some of the best dancers in Papua New Guinea okay. uh, we have. And the face painting, the, the head dresses, oh, the whole costume is really, really special. And I think you go, if you land in Port Mosby in uh, International Airport, the Cairo people's faces will be 
uh, put all around the international airport because I think that uh, goes into a lot of magazines. Uh, it's not fully dressed, but yeah. it gives you an idea of yes. how it looks like. What are your thoughts on this image here? Uh, personally, it's, it's just a bit of a raw emotion to it, you know, yes. uh, you know, like, oh, this could be my people. Uh, but they're more from the coast. Yes. Um, and you can see the similarity, they could be from Samurai, from, I can't really tell where they are from, but definitely they're not from the highlands where I come from. Yes. So I cannot comment more on this. Yeah. But there, there's some similarity when you see the gasket and you see the, yes. the concert oh, yeah. there. So that's, that's uh, some real connection. And yes. like I said earlier, that's a mother from the Caribou, the central province. Yes. The bilum that the baby is sleeping in, the swing bag that's called a bilum. That's called a the bilum. Bilum. Yeah, bilum. Yeah. It, is, it serves a lot of purpose. Yes. It's something to do. And the down is a gift to put food in, to put small items, to carry a baby. It's just multi purpose. And in this particular place, uh, the bilum is carrying a baby. That's right. Have you ever been uh, sleeping in the bilum? Um, I'm not embarrassed to say that yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, all my kids have been sleeping in the room, but Emmanuel, we, uh, it's not only the best sleep, but I think it's, once you swing it a bit, I think it gives the mothers a really long break during the day so they can take up and care of other chores. But it, yeah. it takes a long time to really have a good sleep. And speaking of buildings, we have here in the uh, Powerhouse collection some buildings right here that yes. the kids are holding on to. Yeah, in particular, yeah. this bilim seems to be very, very old. Yes, it's... Could you tell us more about this it, It's more... Uh, first, I think it's, um, it's more from the coast. Yes. Um, because I'm not from the coast, I think it's very similar to what I have seen in the Medang or city yeah. area. Yeah. Um, so, I, because of the size, I think this is more for food collection in the garden. Yes. It's too small for a baby. Yes. Uh, but it's too big for just carrying a little bit of something. Oh, okay. So... And what do you think the material is? Uh, usually from, from bags, tree bags, but you've got to beat it, dry it, yes. get the juice out, put, put it out to dry and then just weave it on your, your skin. To make the... To make it go tight. So yeah, and the string. Then weave it together. The knitting thing, it can take, take a long time to knit. And it looks like also that the weaving of it, it's got colors. Yeah, I mean... So would they dye that from... Yeah, they dye it, yes. Uh, usually they dye them, but also the design also tells uh, somebody's identity. There could be a story, uh, there could be something special about where they have come from. Yes. Uh, I mean, if yes, here's another below, another this, this is something uh, that Possibly it comes from Timbu, Goroka, or Hagen, where I come from, and we come from Hagen. Yes. And you will notice that there's something special on it. That's a fur of a possum. Oh, yes. So if you get, so sometimes if you do me a favor, or you visit me and now you return. Yes. And the gift is very important. Thank you is not enough. People express, sometimes people don't say thank you or anything. People have no sense of gratitude, but Thank you is done through action rather than through words. Yes. Uh, these days, some, I see coastal people more inclined to carry a bilum from the highlands, and the highlanders would be inclined to carry a bilum from the coast because they, they want to, at, at this field, something a little bit different and special about uh, and it's also a gift thing. And just talking about the design of the bilum and the production of the bilum, how is that going in terms of the passing down of the knowledge from the older generation to the younger yeah. generation? Could you describe that to my, us? My father was a champion hunter. He could, he could just take anything down from a certain height, but that doesn't make me a hunter. <laughs> so, bilum is the same. Fishing is the same. There yes. will be a lot of girls in the house, yes. but there, some don't. There are some, you know, there's somebody who's always gifted. So in saying that, in terms of producing the bilum and passing it on, what are the challenges then for for the bilum manufacturing and passing down? I, I don't have a silver bullet for it. I don't have a real answer for this. I, that's always been my on my mind. Yeah. Uh, and that's one of the main reasons why I started the Papua New Guinea Cultural Association. Yes. To pass on some of these little things. It may look insignificant. Yes. But 
at least that connects us to our roots. Yeah. One of the biggest difficulties in Papua New Guinea you would have, Mark, we are about 8, 8 million people now. We have about 800 plus languages. Okay. Languages, it's not just like a dialect, slightly different. Mm. I'm talking about like Chinese and English or something, you right. know, like, I, that's my opinion is that because of the rugged terrains, the mountains, the fast flowing rivers, uh, and the fear of being attacked, so you don't go over the horizon, you might even fall over the world and you, you know, just fall forever. So that, that kept people in little pockets around the, the, the island, so they developed their own languages without having any exchange or trade. Fear, religion, all kind of things just connected to it and there was no trade or interchange, unless we were just discovered in the 30s, 40s. Uh, so slowly we intermarriages. Um, I mean, if I were, my parents were not discovered, I wouldn't have, I would have kids completely looking different than the kids I have in front of me. And it's a blessing and it's a, it's some kind of a challenge as well. That's why there are certain things I cannot go specific about this. Yes. I can only speak about my culture, yeah. the American culture. Yeah. Hey John, what do we have here? Well, that's uh, basically called the bed of paradise. Uh, the Regina Bed of Brothers, I think that's a scientific name, I could be wrong. But that's also our national bed and the national emblem of uh, Papua New Guinea. So you see it on New Guinea, you see it on all yes. kinds of things. People will uh, look at the Bed of Brothers in different ways and the interpretation, the character, the meaning. But from where I come from, where Emmanuel comes from, uh, the, a Bed of Brothers has a special characterization where it's not like just any other bird will come out and make noise yes. randomly. Okay. This bird comes out on courtship times, or uh, regeneration. So this, uh, this has been observed by our, from generations. They observe the bird's uh, movement when it comes, when it displays its feathers, it's just too beautiful and the dancing. So th these kind of characteristics are now placed on, brought it back to life through, through ceremony. The way we dance, the way we hit the kundu drum, the way we sing, it is as though this bird has come to life, but only on your head. Yes, yes. Um, I think that's only the headdress, but this, this could be even bigger than this. What we have here is small, but if you, it could come even further up here. Um, John, do you have any uh, sort of messages that you would like to share with our global audience? I am a believer that uh, kids, into, uh, taking the kids in a journey that they uh, understanding where they come from, giving them a strong, strong sense of belonging will only make them better even we live here. Yes. I think that's, that's something that if they fail in relationship, if they fail in education, if they got fired from the job, uh, this thing, the culture of what we're doing today is the cushioning. It's the cushioning that gives us the kids to fall back and just become resilient and I think culture does that and I think that's my personal experience uh, and you see I think you've seen it before I, I keep on dragging my kids and I try to leave it not only saying it but by leaving it by example that yes what I'm doing now for my kids is very important and I want other families to notice that uh, I mean I can teach somebody to become, a, become an accountant become a lawyer become a pilot anything but if I cannot teach them the culture if these things fail uh, I think something they can fall back to is their own identity. Yes. That's, that's the foundation, that's a cornerstone and I would encourage every uh, Papua New Guinea, we call it one talk, any one talk out there or whoever, whatever culture you come from, understanding one, where you come from, your roots, is the number one foundation. And if everything has failed, that's where we'll throw you back again to yeah. get back on the horse's back. It's, it's this culture, and what we're doing is something I'm very proud of. I think that I am privileged to have my eyes open to understand this. And I, I'm not trying to impose it on people, but I think people need to embrace and start understanding this yes. before we lose it.